So a very warm welcome to businesses that are joining us today for the River Science Tax Basics for SMEs, together with Peter Sarit of Sarit and Associates. They are based in six provinces within South Africa. So a very warm welcome for this workshop. Now, being in South Africa, we do have the added challenge of load shedding. Uh, we actually have a generator as our backup plan. It was meant to go off at two. So if for any reason we get disconnected, please just um, connect back in. It will probably just be a couple of minutes. We also will have this um, recorded webinar on demand um, on our social media channels. So if you're battling from your side with the load shedding, you're welcome to watch it at any time. Um, so my name is Juliette Matthias. I'm with River Sands Incubation Hub, and I'd like to present to you um, Peter. Just before I hand over, I'd like to say that um, you're most welcome to use the chat functionality. If you have any comments or questions, we will note them. And then at the end of the session, um, we will have a, a question and answer and Peter will be happy to answer any of your chat questions or you can raise your hand and we'll open up questions to you. Okay, over to you, Peter. Thank you so much, Juliet, and welcome everyone. Um, so I hope we'll have some interesting times today. Um, <clears throat> just a minute while I share my presentation. And then if I can just get a thumbs up at the moment, everyone can see the presentation from your side and we should be good to go. So as, as, as already introduced, um, my name is Peter Sirite. I'm the MD and founder of SNA Chartered Accountants. Um, so we've had quite an interesting journey this year. We're sitting in about six provinces at this point. I mean, today I'm doing the webinar from the River Sand campus where we have one of our offices here. So we do quite a number of work with the River Sands IHAP. Some of these trainings that you'll see today, but more than anything, if you are around, if you're an SMME on campus, do pop by, we're based in the admin block. And let's really unpack and see how we can grow your business. So today, I mean, this project, we're doing it under the Thrive Initiative, and it's actually well positioned as is in the Global Entrepreneurship Week. Uh, so to all entrepreneurs out there, big ups to you and everyone that's really joining us today, whether an entrepreneur or not, I hope you find this session quite informative and useful for you. I expect it to be useful, firstly, because you're paying your taxes, and secondly, SARS has been on a rampage finding those that are not complying. So with that said, um, again, I'd like to extend our warm, warm, warmest regards to the River Sands. Uh, I have team, Juliet, Tabs, the rest of the team, brilliant work they're doing. I mean, about a week ago, I was on site. It was beautiful to have NetBank as well, sponsoring the SMME awards that took place last Friday. Brilliant, brilliant stellar event. And actually a testament that really indeed the future of South Africa, the future of this continent at large is sitting within our SMEs. And to just jump right into it, I think the load shading just kicked in. So maybe we might give it a minute or two. Or I can still get a thumbs up if you guys can still get transmission from me. So, so the load shedding think, has indeed kicked in, Peter. Um, I think we still have everyone with us. Um, so we're going to keep going. Uh, great. Right. Perfect then. Um, so as I've already explained, we, we, we run a digital accounting practice and a traditional audit practice throughout South Africa. We've got offices in Houghton. So Houghton, we've got about three campuses, two in the Johannesburg area, one in Pretoria all the way down in KZN, West Cliff, those guys that are around uh, the pavilion area just opposite the mall, that's where we are in KZN. Nelspreit, we, we recently are coming to you, but in Whitbank, you can find us as well in town. Just again, find this information on our website and on our various social platforms. Uh, Northwest, we are in Rustenburg. Limpopo, we are in Bulukwane. And Western Cape, we're coming to you very soon together with Free State. And effectively today, what I want us to just unpack is some basic tax principles that would affect you as the business owner, it would affect your employees, it would affect you in your personal capacity, and it would affect the economy at large, being SARS and what they need to collect. Um, and then maybe something to also just mention out there, 
I've been fortunate enough to be one of the finalists for the Saika Top 3535. It's quite a um, remarkable milestone in one's personal career, but more importantly, in our growing journey as a business today. Because every so often as business owners, we, we, we get tempted to think that, am I what I, is what I'm doing actually valuable? Is what I'm doing meaningful? And every now and again, being shortlisted or being a winner of these type of awards actually is confirmation and sort of a pat on the shoulder to say you're on the right track and keep doing what you're doing. Cool. So now what we're gonna hope to cover within the next hour and a half or so will be some tax basics around the infamous income tax, the Fed tax, PYE, how the actual returns are submitted and last but not least our annual CIPC. So before we even jump in, what is the importance of this? I, I've always said before I do this type of training, especially around tags, I want to find out from the SMMEs who recently has gotten a letter or a message or something from SARS requiring some sort of payment. Just show by show of hands as we are going on. Because I'm going to tell you why and how all of this kind of feeds into what we'll be doing. So now when we're then looking at income tax, I always say as a business owner, I have a five rule principle. So the five rule principle is based that way that I need to pay my income taxes. My income taxes are paid right at the end of the year. And then SARS says, but the year is too far. So something in between that they call a provisional tax will need to be done. So provisional tax is something I do somewhere right at the middle of the year. And then I pay my taxes at the end of the year, which kind of makes sense. So SARS is saying, we have allowed you to do business in South Africa. We have created um, policies and an environment that is conducive for you to run your business, surely you should be liable and happy to pay your taxes. So that'll be the first one. And then just under the first subsection, we look at what SARS then introduced, because given that a lot of SMEs were not saying, but SARS, for us to comply with the same tax regulation that a listed entity would have, that a multinational entity would have, is quite onerous on us as, as, as small businesses. How do we then go about it? Then that's when SARS would have introduced what they call the turnover tax, the income tax for small businesses. Now, again, rule number one here, you need to qualify for that. So now if you don't know if you qualify for it or not, between you and me, get in touch with me so I can assess. But if you do have an accountant, I mean, by all means, have the conversation with your accountant to find out, do I qualify for the small turnover tax? That is actually a tax on small businesses to ensure that you have some sort of tax breaks, right? And then while we're still on the income tax, something worthwhile noting is that during the 2020 calendar year, 2021 financial year, for those that have a fair year end, you would have seen government would have introduced at different parts of the year relief schemes, whereby they would either say, if you're paying your PAYE, you are now eligible to get some sort of relief, or you can come and apply to the UIF as part of the tariffs, temporary relief schemes, so that they can aid you. That's one of the first things that I'd say is a benefit for having your tax in order. Number two, it's if you're a business and you're looking to grow, that's, that's what I'd assume you're in business, is to grow, make more money, become profitable, buy that holiday home, do what you want to do with your money. But even then, tax becomes quite a big thing, whether for banks, whether for investors, and even just for your day-to-day -day running. I personally wouldn't feel comfortable doing business with someone that doesn't have their tax in order. And generally, again, a rule from me, I don't like clients that also have an issue with SARS, okay? Because very soon, me and you are going to end up having to give SARS some sort of formal documentation or testimonial in terms of what we've, what we've been doing as a business. What we've seen over the past couple of months is we've seen actually SARS jack up quite a lot in their systems internally, introduce quite a lot of artificial intelligence, robotics, so that what the process initially would have been done by a person calling you, uh, I'm calling from SARS, have you paid your tax? We've seen that process then being triggered and automated by systems and machines. So that should tell you that the margin of error is gradually closing in. So if you don't have your tax affairs in order, again, don't say I didn't warn you. Let's get that stuff in order. Right. So now this income tax, now I, I don't want to be too technical, but at the same time, I want to always reference us back to the act so that whenever someone says, why do I need to pay tax? You understand why? The whole concept, why we even pay tax, it's law. It's sitting in your income tax act. 
So you can go on Google, Google www, government, SARS, TED, why me pay? You'll get your answer why you should pay. Because that is the single most way that government is able to get in on their revenue. Keep in mind, SARS is a collecting arm of the government. So the government, this afternoon, actually, we have the midterm budget plan by our Minister of Finance, who then will be talking about what are the government's plan for the remainder of the period until we guess we get the next budget speech late Feb into March. And then what actually goes into that? His total income, it's coming from me and you through the tax mechanisms that SARS space, largely. I mean, I can attest that there'll be customs duty for guys importing and exporting, all types of taxes, but we're gonna focus on the basic, basic ones. And again, if you are one of those entities that are sitting, for example, in the diesel space, you are subject to cons uh, custom tax, uh, you're subject to SADC withholding tax within Africa. Those would be a bit complex. And for the sake of this discussion, I will not touch on. Yes, I might take one or two questions around that, but generally let's keep it basic because I know it does get complicated. For example, this morning I had a consultation for someone that has staff coming in from China, I think. So the elements of expert tax, Peter, how do I treat that? For this discussion again, guys, we're going to keep it purely basic. Now, Questions, as Juliet had already mentioned, we will take them towards the end, but as and when we are discussing, pop them in the chat so that you don't forget and so that towards the end we can start dealing with the questions. Right. So now, again, if we look at what income tax is, now these slides are going to be up together with the recording, but effectively in its purest form, if you're a company, SARS is saying, I need to tax you 28% of what you make as a taxable income. Now, it sounds so fancy. It's a nice word, taxable income. What is that? Then the same act goes back to define what taxable income is. Taxable income is then my gross income, whatever I make as a business trading or doing business in South Africa. Now, keep in mind, this is slightly different if you're an individual. So we'll also talk slightly a bit about the type of entity you run. So let's take a few step backs. I'm a business owner. Um, I go to CIPC day one where I start trading. Then there's a structure I have. Either I have a PTY, which is a company that will be subject to normal tax rate 28%, or I'm what they call an individual or a sole trader, sole proprietor. You would have heard that a lot. When we see this part a lot, where I grew up, it would be the people that is a one-man show. If he's not there, the business is not doing. I.e., you're an artist, you're a practicing lawyer, you are an accountant day one before you get stuff. So then SARS is there because I cannot differentiate what is your personal income and what is the income coming from the business. I'm going to join them and treat the tax together. They then I'll use what, what they call tax tables. Okay. And then from there, if you're using um, a trust, now these tax tables will range anything from 18%. That's what they'll charge you when you're starting out. I think you need to be making it around about 250 to 300K per annum of taxable income, all the way to 40% where you are in the higher bracket, where you are at a millionaire, right? And then from there, let's say I run the business through a trust. Now, this is something that's becoming quite popular in the past couple of years. Uh, I mean, even in the past week, I, I've noticed some of even our own clients have started with the system that, Peter, I'm getting old. I don't have a proper succession plan. I need to start moving my assets that are in the business or assets in my personal name into some sort of family trust so that when I'm no longer there, the family can still be able to enjoy the benefits. And that will happen through appointment of executors, trustees, and all of that good stuff. So that would be then generally how SAR says whatever structure you have, I need to tax it. If it's a partnership, again, it will follow the rules of a sole proprietor, which is the individual people. Okay, happiness. Then within this, I also say, I understand that you're gonna make money, boom, your gross income, money that comes to you or that flows to your business, right? But within that money you make, there are expenses that you can't necessarily avoid. And these expenses are in you generating that money. For example, Let's say I'm a security company, right? And in being able to render my service so I can get money, I need to buy equipment. I need to spend on vehicles or trucks. I need to get these guys uniforms. I need to 
there's a lot of stuff I need to get in getting the income, i.e. I get a million income, I spend X amount. Let's say that X amount for argument's sake is 400,000. So starts to say, it'll be unfair for me as starts not to allow you that. I need to allow you only the expense to the extent that it has to do with your taxable supplies. Meaning for all of my tender viewers, my tender premiers out there, meaning a, a, a nice trip to Sun City or, or that weekend away in Camps Bay would be very hard. I'm not saying it wouldn't, but it would be very, very hard to prove that that is business expense. Even though by its very nature, you can argue, I had to entertain the client so I'm able to get my work very, very hard because in its purest form, that is entertainment, okay? And then from the services, cool, I'll allow these expenses. So these expenses for all of us, the, the, the ones taking notes, they'll be sitting in my, what they call section 11A, small A, by the way. They'll be my normal trading expenses. I buy stock, I pay security, I pay rent, I da 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 da, -da. Normal expenses I need to incur. Then we have category two, which is now saying, these expenses, they might not be in the normal occurrence of my business, meaning I don't incur these expenses by doing business on a day-to-day. -day. However, these expenses are of a capital in nature. What does that mean, these expenses are of a capital in nature? It means these expenses, firstly, I'm not buying them every month. It's not stock, but I need a warehouse, for example, to put my stock after I've produced it so I can be able to dispatch it from there. Number two, I need a car, or I need to buy a building where we're working from, or I need to lease a building. Those expenses, they're specifically include, excluded from your section 11A paragraph, which is to say all taxable expenses, da 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 da, da, da excluding that of a capital nature. So then now, Sarah so started realizing this is quite tricky because now I have given these guys an allowance or I've given these guys a leeway to deduct the expenses, but a lot of them now are gonna start buying quite a lot of capex ex expenses. Simply put, you're making a million, but you go buy a property for 3 million. So if you had to deduct the entire 3 million, SARS is sitting in there, it's no longer sustainable, yeah? So then SARS decided to realize that, okay, between section 11A all the way to, one might argue 23, 22, 21, um, would look at what we call specific allowances and capital allowances. So capital allowances, again, because they've been specifically excluded from the expenses, there that's when case law would apply. We then say, okay, in the past, how have similar businesses, similar taxpayers kind of treated this type of expense and how did SARS respond to it? Now, the guys that have done some tax, so we know the famous one, your Moy and Nakhan, your Fisser, uh, those are cases that would have taken place where the taxpayer actually had taken SARS to court, trying to prove that, okay, I've expended this, but this is purely for the business. Even though I might not be able to get all of it in one year, surely SARS should be able to allow me to smooth it in um, allowances. And that's what SARS then eventually conceded to and said, okay, for capital gains, I will give you a certain exception. And when now you're buying capital assets, I'll give you certain allowances over a period of time that will match the usage of an asset. For example, if it's a house, I think currently your section 13 queen, six, and the other one will probably be sitting at about 3% or 5%, depending on what type of building it is. If it's a machine, your section 12 will dictate, you're either using accelerated, which is four years, or using five years. But that is simply SARS ways to say that we are smoothing out the benefit you would have wanted to deduct all in day one. Now, all of this would apply if you are not on the small business turnover tax, okay? So cool, up until this point, we are still all right. Still all right, so you started a business, you expended cost, boom, 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 you buy your stock, you claim the tax on it, right? And then from there, I start selling. When I sell, SARS says, I need to touch a bit of that tax. Cool. And then all of that, what is it sitting at? It's sitting at the percentage we spoke at. 28% if it's a company and the, on the profit. If I'm an individual, I have those tax brackets. If I'm a trust, I'm sitting at a flat rate, okay, of 40. Cool. And then you realize with the trust, I mean, if this was a master class, we'll actually be delving into why SARS actually got to say, we'll text you at the maximum. Because generally, we've seen a pickup from the guys at the courts and just how people have been using trading trust. That trust has become sort of a haven where people would put in their assets and really SARS would lose out on that. 
Perfect. So now these types of taxes that we look at. So the first category we looked at was the income tax, where we said is the tax that you get taxed on providing goods or services. Whether you're a service provider like myself, where I don't generally have stock, I need to pay tax because what I would then do, I would then charge a client for the service. Boom, 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 I'm here today. But I would also incur an expense. I need an office. I need people that would prepare all these slides. I need petrol to get here. I need flights to go down to Durban for my next session. So all of those things, Sarah says, Peter, it's only fair that we allow you to claim it because at the end of the day, you're gonna, we want you to sit in a position where you're making profit and we will enjoy from that profit, okay? Then from there, we move over to the personal income tax. Keep in mind, SME Chartered Accountant is a business. Yes, it's a business owned by Peter, who happens to be also Sirite and the business also Sirite, but the two are two different taxpayers. Sirite and Associates has to pay his tax as a business, right? And then Peter, as an employee or a director of the business still needs to pay taxes. Now here, this is where I'll keep flashing because this is where a lot of us start getting it wrong. I can tell you eight out of 10 of the businesses I've seen, the problem is sitting around your personal tax. Someone assumes, no, my tax has been paid. Yeah, your company's paying because you have to comply with CSD so that you can get your tender, but you haven't been paying your income tax for the past four or five years. Why is the case? Keep in mind, you as a director or you as an employee in your business, you still get a salary. Whether you take it every month or not, that's a different story. My tip to you, make sure you take it, okay? <laughs> uh, but, but nonetheless, you then pay a salary to yourself as an employee that's employed by your company, meaning the company is a juristic person that is also a taxpayer. That's why your company has its own tax number and you as the director will have your own tax number. Then how does this money flow from the business into you? I always say there's two general ways. Yes, there's more than five, if you ask me, when we look at tax planning, but the two common ones are through a salary. Then that's where as an employee, I'm subject to the tax bracket. How much am I earning? What's the tax on that? I need to pay employee tax to start every month, pay my SDL, PYE, and UIF. Tick, 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 tick. Cool. I'm going to ask you a question then. Then what happens as a director? Can I retrench myself to go get the UIF claims? Quite an interesting story, but we're going to look at some cases around that. Okay. And then category two is where I say as a business owner, I've got multiple businesses, right? Like myself. So I don't necessarily take a salary from company A, but I take from company B and company B will pay my taxes, do everything. But in company A come here and I'm gonna take a bonus or what is commonly known as a dividend. Again, that is a type of personal tax. It will require it to be taxed. Simple rule of thumb, right? Whenever money leaves the company, Within, without any hope of it coming back. It only makes sense that SARS will want to tax it. And even if you were SARS, right? I, I unfortunately, you know, weren't able to organize the commission under short notice, but even if the commission was here and then he was retiring from SARS and a certain portion of his money was leaving SARS to go to him for pension, that money is leaving without any hope of ever coming back. SARS wants a piece of it. Same as when you pass away. I mean, no one wants to talk about this, but actually this for us is one of the fastest growing type of business. We're now, we started exploring estates. we are now talking to our clients to say, cool, you for years have been working in this business, creating so much wealth, but the day you pass away, what happens? Because your estate will sit with this massive tax loss or this massive tax that needs to be paid. What happens? And that's where the structure needs to happen while you're still alive. One of the million dollar question I get around personal income tax is that, Peter, what do you advise? Do you advise that I take a tax? Do you advise that I take dividends at the end of the year? Or do you advise that I take a consistent salary? Or do you advise that I take a bonus? I always say it depends on your business, number one, and it depends also on your cash flow and your cycles. What I've always advised my clients is that a hybrid works. Keep in mind, you start at the lower end of your taxes, you maximize whatever it is, and the excess, you then can go through the dividend withholding model. Because keep in mind with the dividend withholding model, it's a flat fee of 10%. Versus if now you're earning a salary, it starts from about 18%, escalates all the way to 40%, right? And then from there, if now I'm want, 
if I have applied as a business owner to be what they call a small business tax, I will then apply that overall rate and do what I need to do. Okay, now another important point in our previous session, this came up quite a lot that there are two sides of the story here. There's the SARS compliance, which is informing SARS completing your ITs, doing your IRPs, whatever it is that you need to do, and this pain side. Those two things needs to always be kept differently. Because what I see a lot of clients, clients would say, okay, Peter, I know I made a profit this year. I'm not gonna submit my tax because I'm gonna have to pay SARS. That is the worst thing to do. And if there's an accountant giving you that type of advice out there, call me, let's go report him, okay? That is the worst type of advice to give. Comply. Submit your returns. Let SARS know how much you've done. And then from there, apply for some sort of payment plan. Inform SARS, SARS, yes, I know I owe you 200,000 in tax, but I don't have the cash flow. If I'm gonna give you the cash flow there, I'm not gonna be able to pay my staff, I'm not gonna be able to pay my rent. So SARS, what I can do, I can pay you over time. Nine out of 10 times SARS wouldn't say no. Because keep in mind, SARS, I always say, it's a very patient body because you might run away from SARS this year. You might run away from SARS next year. But at some point in time, dead or alive, SARS will catch you, okay? If they don't catch you in your life, they'll catch you definitely at your estate when now you are no longer there to even explain what really happened. And I work with quite a number of states and trust me, it is quite ugly because some of the families or some of the situations we give our families and it's quite dire where someone is sitting with a huge um, tax bill that even their assets and donning donies and investments doesn't really cover that. Now we need to start looking, what are we selling? Who are we putting on auction? And, and really, especially when you're no longer there, that is not the type of drama you want to leave for your family. So your tax affairs is something you need to make sure they're always done and they're done well. Righty. So now, I guess the next question will be, I want to pay the least amount of tax. So that means as an SMME, I want to go to what they call the turnover tax or the small business tax. Now, again, for my scholars or learners, this will be section 12 cap E in your income tax act. That will say for small corporates, that means you need to meet a specific definition. What is a specific definition? You must at least be registered for income tax. Generally, what we see these days is that the moment you register your company, automatically it registers your tax. It's almost sort of your ID number, your tax number, okay? If it employs staff in your SDL, UIF, PAYE, and total payroll does not exceed 500. If it exceeds 500, you'll then be on the normal one. But if it doesn't, then your turnover is below a million, then you can um, apply for your small business tax. And then now, if your turnover is over a million, what does it trigger, 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 trigger? VAT, compulsory VAT. So that's what now we're going to start talking to. So at this point in time, around the income tax and all sorts of tax, um, okay, so I see in the chat box, some people have received stuff from SARS and some people have not received stuff from SARS. Okay, to quickly talk to that, right? At this point in time, probably even on radio, you're hearing everyone, make sure your tax is submitted by the end of November. Make sure your taxes is done by the end of November. That is your personal tax. That's not your business, that's your personal tax. That means you as a human being, that is an ID number that was voting last week, Monday or Tuesday, if you're above the age, if not, still you, okay? You still need to submit your taxes. And then those, that's where if you're employed, your employer needs to give you your IRP5. If you're an employer, you need to give your employees your IRP5 just to make sure that everyone submits that tax and SARS is able to start connecting between now and I guess, um, the end of their financial year. You'll realize a lot of people are banking on um, extensions and extensions because traditionally that's something SARS would do. But what we've seen in the past year, especially with the auto assessments, because auto assessment, it's a new system that SARS has said, we're gonna use artificial intelligence or machine learning so that it's almost the system is able to predict what your tax should be based on your last year's information and what would have happened during the year. Okay, and then as we're going, I'm gonna tell you some funnies that we sit, because I sit that's this side and that side of the fan. I've been fortunate enough this year, we, we have audited SARS. So I've gotten to see stuff from SARS perspective as well. Why is SARS needing them to happen the way they are? So if end of November passes and you haven't submitted, being the one paying is a different story, but if you haven't submitted, then penalties start. 
Yes, SARS wants us to pay, but no one says you have to pay the full amount there and they can get into an arrangement. It's good. If you have the money, please do pay it. Now, I don't want people not paying SARS. Reason being that Peter said you don't have to pay that amount. If you have the amount of money, pay SARS, okay? Because that's what makes sure there is somewhat of service delivery in this country for those that generally are not contributing to the fiscus. So now, cool, we've dealt with you as the individual. You need to make sure you've submitted or penalties are gonna start and then the interest on top of penalties that accumulate. So yes, you can get to a point where you really will serve a lot of money. We see this again in a lot in the um, sports and in the arts. So what we see in the arts, uh, I'll use a very close friend of mine that's in that space as well. You get a musician that has to go perform overseas and if they need to go perform overseas, let's take this, I'm a piano DJ, they say, okay, give me my 100,000 before I actually leave South Africa. Promoter coming in from Nigeria pays the 100,000. Keep in mind, the source might be from Nigeria, but Sar says, as long as you're a citizen, I need to tax you on what? Whatever you make on this globe, the entire globe, your worldwide earnings, right? So meaning you could be paid in dollars, SARS needs to know and tax you on that. You could be paid from Japan, SARS needs to know and tax you on that. You could be paid from anywhere else. Quite interesting here is a lot of my clients that in their personal space are doing Forex, Bitcoin, whichever other um, cryptocurrency they're involved in. And their question is that, no, I've never had to, but all of a sudden this year SARS is on my case. Yes, because SARS is saying, whatever you make on your global scale, I need to have a portion of that because you're a certain son of here. And as a government, there are certain things I need to do for you, or if not directly for you, for your related or connected people. Okay, so that's on the individuals and I guess personal income tax. Now, this is the part I always tell business owners, you should know and be able to do yourself. If you're gonna come to me as an accountant to do your personal tax, I can do it, but it's not gonna come cheap. And normally I always say, if you just have a salary, you might have a property, a rental income, yana day. that should still not be complex. Go do that yourself. You need to understand how to do your taxes. Because what I see quite often, especially in my higher earning clients, they move from accountant to accountant to accountant. And at some point in time, they don't even know the story they've been telling SARS. But SARS will never hold your accountant responsible because ultimately the responsibility is sitting with you, the taxpayer. And that will apply even to your company. What I see as well, clients would not even know who has their tax profile. They come to me, Peter, SARS sent me an email. They say, I owe money. I used to have an accountant. This guy is no longer responding. Yeah, firstly, you didn't pay him, but that's not my business. But secondly, the responsibility is still sitting with you. Yes, you have an accountant, but you as the business owner, you need to know these things and actually use it to keep your accountant in check. Now, again, over the past couple of months, we have seen quite a number of accountants SARS have been shying, punishing because they have been actually mis or ill advising clients. One thing I always say to clients that rock up in my office, make sure whichever client accountant you're working with, myself included, go check them on the various professional bodies that they work with. For example, if someone comes to you and says, I'm a registered tax practitioner, you can actually call SARS themselves to confirm that. Or you can ask them, which body are you registered with? If they're registered with, let's say, a SICA, which I'm part of, you can go check there. Is this person a registered tax practitioner? Because what we see too often is a lot of people out there present themselves to clients as qualified accountants, tax practitioners, and then they come in, they shasha the system, they go, client pays them. Three years later, SARS comes back, they want to audit. That person is no longer on the face of the earth, business owner sitting with a penalty the responsibility still is with you as the business owner, okay? Cool, I'm glad we are on the same page when it comes to that. Right, now for those people that have gotten letters from SARS that you owe them, um, don't, don't call me, don't, don't, even, don't even look my direction, okay? <laughs> now I'm kidding, but on a more serious note, you need to take that correspondence seriously. You need to download it. Sometimes the PDF is a bit funny. Go download the latest Adobe Reader. Look at it. 
What are they saying? Do they need you to furnish them evidence? Normally, that will be the first step. They'll say, dude, A, B, C, and D is not adding up. And I'll give you a type of scenario when it's not adding up. It's when now you told SARS you don't have a house, right? Or you don't have any other income. But SARS is saying, dude, I'm picking up two, three, four properties under your name. Are you saying you're staying at all of these properties? Because keep in mind, on SARS' side, right? They can link to CIPC, see your business, what you said you're doing in your business. They can link to CSD. CSD, you told CSD, I'm making over 50 million, blah, blah. So you can qualify for that tender, right? They can see the, the, the properties deeds office, which properties are actually registered under your name. And the normal view is that if I have five properties, surely I'm staying at one. And then the other four, I have rental income. Or if let's say from the banks, they can see you're trading in crypto or there's some sort of foreign currency you are getting and they'll start asking these questions. Now the first step, and you'll always think that SARS is it's a bit doff if you ask me. Because they first ask you, dude, you told us A, B, C, and D, but our records show something different. They give you the first chance to come clean, to say, dude, what's happening? Then a lot of people then again try to screw over SARS. No SARS. Actually, that property, my mom stays there. Uh, that other one, yo, I have never been staying there for a while. Da, 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 da. You submit that. Because keep in mind, the onus, the act is quite clear to say the onus is on you, the taxpayer, right? SARS can only ask questions. And then you submit this information, SARS takes it as evidence. Then they say, cool, they do further tests. When they then do further tests, the property told them no one stays there. There's electricity usage, there's water usage, because they still have access to the municipality rates and stuff. Same as you said, you stayed in Pretoria, there's water and electricity, but also in Camps Bay, we're finding water and electricity in the usage and rates. They'll say, but dude, you have a bill. So who's actually staying there? And actually what we've seen, which is very rare, we'll then see SARS in those cases now again, cost benefit if you're really that high of a taxpayer SARS will then have people go investigate sometimes they'll even subcontract to the likes of that would do what we call a lifestyle audit that means what SARS has on its record versus this information that's coming the two are not corresponding again another tip what we've seen in the past year or so is that SARS has started using social media as well to determine if someone's lifestyle on social media talks to the information he has said. I was looking at a particular case. So this person, the last time they registered as a taxpayer, they were a student, right? So they were tutoring at one of the universities in Johannesburg, could be UJ or not, not gonna confirm. So, you know, when you're tutoring there, you'd have to register for your taxes. Then from your tutorial income, they would deduct a certain tax amount, but because you're below the threshold, you can go uh, claim that back, right? So this person never went back to SARS to update that. So year on year, they are now putting in the same information to say, I'm still earning that tutor income da, 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 below threshold. In their mind, they're tricking SARS, right? But then eventually the system caught up with them. Now we live in the 21st century, so I can just Google you, whatever name I see. And then there the person was on Instagram, living life, la loca, na enjoyment, na enjoyment in nice house, now enjoyment in nice car. And Sarah says, but dude, according to our records, you're still unemployed. You're doing tutoring at UJ. You're still looking for a job. You haven't paid Nesfa's back. But on Instagram is now enjoyment. What's happening? And normally we see with that, that will trigger what they call a lifestyle audit. Now, I always, by the time you know and understand that a lifestyle audit is happening on you, it's too late. And you can't now go and say, I won't post. There are just so many avenues we can use. Another one that we see quite happen often, it's also the tickets, right? So the traffic department, you're driving your nice M4. They find you on William Nickel late in the evening. They write a ticket. That thing, they capture it on the system. It goes onto the database. Peter's driving an M4, cool, cool, cool. But Saras is like, hold up. Peter, according to our records, is still a student. How did Peter get to now start owning M4s, you know? So SARS, moral of the story, they do have access to information. To what extent they can use that access, it's at their prerogative, depending again, cost benefit. If you're a taxpayer that's gonna end up paying 200,000, does it make sense that I go hire Peter, who charges about 3.5 an hour to come investigate you for 20 hours just to get 200,000 cost benefit. So it's not that they've forgotten about you, they're still coming, okay? So cool. Now, let's say this concept of tax 
You haven't registered anything. You haven't done anything. Literally, www SARS e filing. You go register now there. I like that they have now a sort of uh, a chatter box that you can chat to once you get to the SARS website. You can go to a SARS branch because a lot of people are using now nah, COVID. You can't go in. SARS has a toll free number. You can call in the morning, be on hold the whole day. It's okay. It's a toll free number. But make sure you get your SARS stuff sorted. Okay. And then, for example, those people that have registered once upon a time, but you forgot your password, even if you go into the website, you should be able to reset your password. Keep in mind, you're going to have two profiles at a minimum. Your own personal one as a human being and your company one, if again, you're a sole director, whatever the case or the structure of your company. Cool. Up until this point, I think we, we, we do get a grip that we don't want to owe SARS, okay? And if you do owe SARS, don't call me, okay? <laughs> all righty. Um, all right, so I see some recordings and stuff that will be going on. Lovely. So now we're jumping into the VAT. So now VAT, keep in mind, it's slightly a bit different because VAT is not a type of direct SARS. It's not a type of tax. But VAT, it's sort of an indirect. So VAT is something actually all of us, whether you're paying your taxes or not, that is something SARS actually gets. So what is VAT? VAT is what we call value added tax. Now in South Africa, we call it VAT, but this is a phenomenon throughout the world. This is used. This is the way um, SARS is able to collect the value added services on businesses. What do I mean? I always want to simplify things in their simplest form. Right now, SARS is saying, Peter, because we have created an environment and policies that allows you to go and sell a bottle of water or go sell your services. Like right now, you needed Peter to come to your company to do whatever he needed to do. I come to you say, I say, okay, this will be my invoice. Come, okay? Sarah is saying, if you're making over 80,000 a month, about a million a year, you need to be registered for VAT because clearly you are in the value chain. You're a millionaire. Think about it. You're making over a million, okay? And so once again, it's coming back to be fair to say, for whatever expense you incur, again, I'll have certain exceptions. I will allow you to claim the VAT on it. That means when I go buy the ingredients, these nice clothes for me to come and present today, I'm eligible to come claim the VAT so that when I render the services, I collect the VAT on behalf of SARS. What is that rate? It used to be the 14% about two years ago, then it moved up to 15%. I mean, that year was a bit pandemonium for all accountants because we needed to update systems, change in tax rates. But now I think things are settling down, but we're still seeing it every now and again, clients are still taxing at VAT of 14, it's 15, one five, right? So you're saying for every invoice that goes up, again, if you're making over a million services, it's mandatory that you need to register. And, and I need us to underline the words. I'm using my words quite, 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 quite selectively. It's important that you register, meaning you register, SARS tells you that yes, we have approved your registration. Yes, you can start charging VAT from this day and you're part of this category of VAT. And you'll pay VAT over to us every two months, every month on the cash basis or on the invoice basis. The default is on the invoice basis. However, if your business, your business does not make sense for them to be on the um, invoice basis, you can apply to be on the cash basis model. Where do we see often the cash basis model being applied versus the invoice model being applied? It's in those business that either you do business with municipalities. So a lot of my clients that have actually applied for the cash basis, they do business with government. You do business with government, you're a construction guy, you buy material, you da -da 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 pay everything. And then from there you invoice the government, right? Once you invoice them, they pay you after, th they're supposed to pay after 30 days, but we've seen some weird stories. So, but then SARS says, the moment you invoice within 30 days, I need my money. But now SARS, realistically, it's a 20 million invoice. You need 15% of that. This guy hasn't paid me in six months. Where am I supposed to take this money from SARS that you keep wanting for? Yes, he's accepting the invoices, but they just have not been paid. And in those cases, that's when you can start applying for cash basis. Now, again, if you do have an accountant, you want to make sure they're doing these things properly with you. They've got the necessary experience. 
they are a registered tax practitioner. Because keep in mind, SARS would not just talk to anyone that says they're your accountant. The person has to be a registered tax practitioner, belonging to a particular professional body, and be adequately trained and skilled in the space, okay? Now, again, we're just touching on the basics. It does get slightly complex. What if now I'm in the entertainment space? Can I still apply for VET? Because Section 17 of the VET Act says, those that are in the entertainment, some of these expenditures will not be allowed. Because SARS is saying, I'm finding it hard to find how that can be a business expense. But if that is my line of business, then I can. For example, in our office, every now and again, you'll find a nice six pack of Valpri water lager in our fridge, right? The invoice on that, am I allowed to go claim the vet on it? The answer would be no, because I'm not in the entertainment space. But for a client of mine, let's say Loud Fire or whatever entertainment companies are there, they have fridges full of milk stars, black labels, Heineken, whatnot. Can they deduct it? The answer would be yeah. For them, it makes sense. It's in their day-to-day -day business. The same then will happen to certain expenditures, but those ones would look at once we start looking at master classes. Okay, let's not complicate. So that's on your vet. I make a million, I need to register it. However, here are the complexities. Sub says, if I'm not making a million, but for my type of business is beneficial, I can do what they call a voluntary registration. So SARS is being a bit fake, you think about it. It's saying, you need to understand your business. You need to understand what's beneficial, what's not beneficial. If it's beneficial for you, you can register, provided you're making a minimum of 4.2 thousand a month. That will come up to about 50 or so K a month, a year. Then you can register as a voluntary registration. Just because you registered voluntarily does not mean you should not submit your return. Whether you registered voluntarily or the registration was compulsory, you still need to submit those EMP 201s at the end of every month or two months, whether odd or even SARS will tell you. But it needs to be done. There's no way around it. What I've also seen again, haven't been in this space now, guys, in the past 18 months, we have service north of at least 600 SMMEs, right? So you can imagine in the past 18 months, these SMMEs we service, all of them have different perceptions and why they should not be paying tax. And weird enough, I, I, I try to engage with them quite a lot. So you'd be there for these open sessions and one would come and say, but I'm not making a lot of money. Yeah, I'm making money, but not a lot. And I'm like, but you're registered for that. For the fact that you registered and it was a voluntary registration, you need to comply, okay? And I hope we are taking that note very, very, very important, okay? Then from there, cool. We then covered a bit what VAT is. VAT applies to all goods and services at a standard VAT rate of 15%, right? However, there are certain items SARS will deem at zero rate or certain items SARS will deem to be exempt. Those zero rated, if you think about it, those are the ones SARS is saying by their very nature, those products, and there's a whole list in section 11 for zero rated and in section 12 for exempt, all of this is in your VAT Act. It's not in your Income Tax Act, it's in your VAT Act. How does the Income Tax Act come into the VAT Act for all of my scholars? It will be in section seven of your Income Tax Act. Section seven of your Income Tax, that is the link between VAT Act and the Income Tax Act, okay? Or 23C, if you wanna be smart, right? But for now, in the VAT Act, section 11, I've got a list, there's a list there. So if any goods or product is on that list, that will be generally your basic foods. Not all bread, brown bread. Now, again, I've had clients to say, uh, what about whole wheat? What about da -da -da -da? What about, nah, brown bread. If it's not brown bread, there's vet on it, okay? I don't care where you bought it from, whether you're from my friend, whether you're from Woolies, makes no difference. It's brown bread, zero rated. If it's any other type of bread, there's vet on it. Because you hear all sorts of stories, especially for guys that are now in that space, okay? Interesting enough, I'll throw a spanner in the works and I'll answer this question later. What happens if I'm a bakery? I run a bakery. Does it mean for the brown loaves that I charge, I can't levy the vet? Think about it for a bit, but I'll come back to it. So we'll cover the basic stuff. So your milk as well, not all types of milk. So lactose intolerant, you'll be surprised. It might have...
VAT to normal uh, one would not have that. So to pay already they are coded. They are coded in the system. So you don't have to go land by land like hey, 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 tell her here there should not be any VAT. No need for that. Okay. Actually, as a joke, what I used to do when I I, 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 I was a lot younger and I'd like to just play games with, with waitresses and waiters. I would go into to, to a restaurant, would have dinner or chill out with friends, and, and they'll bring the bill and the bill would have fed. And I'm like, no, this, this is a cool man of I'll discuss it with the uh, I was just in a meeting earlier on, but it was just good for laughs. But again, that's something we all need to pay, okay? Now there are certain services which are also exempt. And this will be like what? Educational services. There's no VAT on school fees. Now, again, the spanner comes into the words. Is it school fees at Matlakaneng High School and Secondary? Or is it school fees at Kuro? Still within the same category, right? Educational services. We don't look at where you're procuring it, okay? Whether you're in Bryanston, whether you are in Limpopo, the deep rural areas of Eastern Cape, it does not make a difference. Cool. Public transport as well. That would be your taxis, your bus fare. Unfortunately, our taxes, they don't give us the seats. Checking enough, at some point in time, they were trying to do that, but I mean, from an administration point of view, uh, it's a bit difficult to make that. And lastly, your residential accommodation. Those will be exempt from that because they're not supplies. Education is not supply. Same as salaries, it's not a supply. Those are stuff you incur. So it would not be fair for SARS to actually charge you on those. Cool. So how the VAT works, and, and this is the one VAT that you need to do at least every two months if you're making over a million. So if I'm talking to you out there, you're making over a million, you have not done this. After this, Shama DMs, please, 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 because you're heading for a rocky season, I take. Cool. Then let's say I'm selling goods. I charge VAT on selling goods. So on my invoices, I will then add a 15% on all of my invoices. My invoice is 100,000, add 15% becomes 150. That 115 is not mine. Mine is still the 100,000, right? The 15 I'm collecting from the customer on behalf of SAPS. What I see a lot is that that 115 comes in. See it up, right? When now comes time to pay SAPS, you're like, ah, no, ish, ish. That's not gonna cut it. That's not gonna cut it. That hundred thousand is yours. That fifteen belongs to SARS. Keep it separate, right? Less whatever I purchase. Then whatever I purchased in the business, I paid the rent, I minus. Um, I bought data in the office. That's one of our biggest expenses. I I I bought some office supplies. Less 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 the input tax. Then I say what I owe SARS on my invoice less the 15% of what I incurred. My apologies. What is the net? Do I owe SARS? Do I, the SARS owes me? Funny thing here is that there was a glitch in SARS system, right? And this glitch happened between March and I think May this year. So in that glitch, now they've closed that glitch, people are in jail, okay? Because what a lot of people started doing, they realized that, okay, SARS is not triggering audits on inputs. Generally, if SARS needs to owe you, this is not the general rule from my observation. I'm not saying it's law. Don't quote me on this. If SARS owes you, they will want to know. Same as if you owe someone, you will say, okay, send me a statement. Send me the support. Let me see if I validly owe you. So SARS will trigger an audit. But there was a period of time, I don't know if they were doing systems, reboots, or whatever the case may be, the system was not doing that. So someone will go submit their VAT input. SARS owes me 500. Eh, okay, submit. And then the system, I think we're trying this whole automation. The system tomorrow, two days later, a week later, will release the money. Then knowing our people, they're like, okay, let me go back and see if I take that 500 and make it 5,000 make it 50,000, would it still pick it up? I have nothing to lose, it's COVID, we're under lockdown. So people started getting creative and the system would allow, the system would allow. And eventually people started taking quite a lot from SARS and it caused an imbalance. And SARS says, hold up, let's start investigating them. Needless to say, some of them are in jail. Some of them have to pay fines, both the accountant and some cases, the business owner, because it was a huge, huge um, fair, fair, syndicate that was happening, right? It had people from the inside, people from the outside, and it was just messy, but needless to say, I always say SARS might be slow, but bamba. 
they'll get you. But look at Bopa, bopa, bopa. Okay. Um, so that's the one thing. So normally I hear clients that says, no, but this text uh, practitioner say they can be able to get me that. If that is not a valid transaction, it's not substantiated, don't come to me with it. Go to your tax practitioner that can do that. Some of us really want to enjoy and be in this profession for quite a while. Because SARS will give you penalties. And in certain cases, SARS, yes, they can put you in jail. Okay. I don't want to throw out any names, but I've had clients that I've had to go help bail out from SARS. Okay. Cool. So then it says you can only charge VAT on income and claim the VAT on the expense, provided the expense is to a VAT vendor, right? If the expense is not to a VAT vendor, it's illegal. And, and, and I want us to touch on this. Sabbath's wording in the act calls it also is a transgression. That means you're breaking the law. You can go to jail. We can, I, I, as an accountant, I have an obligation to report you. To all those accountants, again, sitting in this webinar, not reporting your note class and clients that are doing tax evasion, together, Lizoya, together, okay? Because your client is going to say, you didn't say anything. And again, you're going to say, uh, you can't say you didn't know. That's why you went to school. That's why you're a tax practitioner. So, so be careful, be careful. Because one thing I can tell you without fail, SARS has a way of auto-correcting. It might not be in a year. It might not be in two years but the system will autocorrect, right? Now we're coming to the due dates for VAT, okay? So now, practically speaking, month starts. Kiri one, kiri two, kiri three, keep on my invoice, pa, 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 clients pay, 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 clients pay, okay? The rest of the month, you take that money, you run the business, you're servicing jobs, you buy material here, if you are in engineering, if you're a doctor, you go buy your supplies, you do whatever you need to do. And then Sar says, if you, keep in mind when you registered, SARS would have told you, okay, you are either type A, B, C, D, E, F. I think they go up to F or H. My tax knowledge might be a bit scrappy there, but there are categories they put you in. And in those categories, it will tell you how and when you need to pay tax. So it either can say every month if you are past a certain threshold, or it can say every two months. So when it's saying every two months, again, our people, what I've noticed a lot, you want to take that month to only and submit. It says every two months. That means the two months that you had not submitted, you need to submit it together. Jan, Feb, you submit together. March, April, you submit together. May, June, because you're on the even months. Or December, Jan, you're on the odd months. February, March, you're on the odd, uh, odd months. But you need to understand that. And it says if you're submitting manually, that means you're a bit old school. I still have got clients like that month end. You give them their tech stuff, they go to SARS, they queue. Now with um, COVID lockdown, thank goodness, a lot of us don't have to do that, right? But, 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 but that's quite very important. That's quite very important. So if you're still doing the manual or you've got an accountant that's still quite manual, every month they book appointments at SARS and they go do SARS just on the 25th, it needs to be done on the 25th of that month, okay? That's if you're doing it manually. But we are seeing quite a huge drop because either way, month end would have not occurred at that point. You would have incurred all of your expenses. But the reason SARS chose the 25th is that it will be 25th to 25th. So literally, whatever happens on the 25th to the 30th, it will be just covered in the next month. You know, But SARS will just have a lag, but not all hope is lost from an administration point of view. So now, if you're submitting via e-filing, now, this will also talk to those people that are accountants in in what you call this in businesses and they're responsible for doing the submission if you're doing it via e-filing it needs to be the last day of the month so if the month is the 30th 31st 29th 28th the last day of the month so you get some sort of grace period so you can finalize your month and run journals adjustments reviews whatever you need to do failure to do so the act again is quite clear black and white the penalties and interest charged, right? So penalties, SAR says it's anything from 20% to 200%. And interest is on the cumulative balance. That normally is in your section 20 tax administration within your income tax act, no, 120 in your income tax act. They talk about all these penalties, what happens, 
hey, hey, VDVs, you never want to really get there. But in the event that you find yourself there, get a hold of a registered tax practitioner. If it's us, you know you're going to be all right. If it's not us, go vet that this guy's a proper tax practitioner. Make sure you guys sit down and you voluntarily go and submit information to SARS, okay? We've got a strong tax department that can help you with that. I'm not that involved anymore. But, but definitely there are suitable people that can help you within our firm or any other accountant for that matter that is registered. If there's one thing I need you guys to take away is that we need to start moving away as business owners, as SMMEs, to using, when I grew up in the of Matula Church, you know, fly by nights, right? Using fly by nights, accountant, fly by nights, tax practitioners. And how do you identify these fly by nights? Automatically, this person does not even have an e-filing profile. They want to use yours. If it's a proper accountant, they want to say, okay, dude, fill a form so I can go request your stuff from SARS so you can be under my profile. They're going to give you a proper engagement letter. They're going to tell you, I belong to site or I belong to SICA or I belong to cyber, ACA or whichever professional body. But the moment someone does not want to have that information, they'll start saying that, ah, I've been doing this for years. It's easy. Briami, Uspana SARS. Just know you're dealing with a dodgy, dodgy character, okay? All right. Cool, cool, cool. So that's on the vet. Uh, ready. So I see there's quite a number of questions. So maybe I guess at this point in time, before we lose them, let me just see what they are. It says, so I'll take, I'll take some questions as we're going, just so to reduce the load right at the end. So from Terence says, what's the advantage of buying a car under my business? Um, and can I write off the mileage? Okay, again, what is the use? What is the intended purpose of the use? If you're gonna buy a car under the business and that car goes straight into your garage, your kids are going to it with school or whatever it is, that car is still not being used for business. So that SAR says you need to see it as what we call a benefit, a fringe benefit if I'm gonna be smart, okay? But you need to see that as a fringe benefit. However, if I buy a bucket or I buy a car that I use in the business, then Sam says you need to use a logbook to split what was your business expense and what was your personal expense. Because the reality is not all of the expenses will be business. Unless if, if it was a business car, that thing will stay at work. Anyone would drive it. Uh, there would be a Ross that they, then all of that. Then Sam says, sure, I will allow both the installments that you're paying, you can deduct the VAT and I'll allow the deduction on your uh, installments on the car, okay? Well, that's even now the car is being used in the business. But if there's now an element where new weekend, two weeks from now, you're driving that car, Saika says, hey, give me logbooks. Kilometers will help me split, okay? And then again, it also depends. Uh, is this sitting in your contract with the business as a fringe benefit? Or is this now a car anyone in the company can use? Now, this is quite interesting because I, I said on the committee when we're now trying to regulate the churches in terms of uh, being that and tax compliant, right? And a lot of churches will say, no, 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 no. The church cars are the church cars. Anyone in the church can use them. But you're like, okay, can I, as a member, get in there and say, Mfundis, yes, in an interview, Eastern Cape, can I borrow the car? If the answer is not yes, then there's exclusive use. And then that exclusive use, the tax benefit must follow whoever can use it. I.e., if the pastor and the executive members are the ones that can use that car, then it's a fringe benefit for them. It needs to be that tax calculation, right? But it is quite an interesting conversation to do have because I'm also, yeah, I do quite a lot of consulting in that space. Then from Kutiso says, you say we should keep the 15% VAT separate from our sales income. Does that mean that we need to have a separate account for VAT collected through sales? Separate account, yes, in your accounting books, not account at the bank. Because keep in mind, practically what would have happened, customer would have paid you the money including the VAT. You cannot take the 15 and transfer it to another bank. For me, it doesn't solve anything. In your accounting system, Right. If you have an accounting system, it can be QuickBooks, it can be zero, it can be Sage. I'm not here to promote any type of accounting system, but a decent accounting system should be able to have some sort of VAT tracking. Quite interesting, guys. Personally, I recommend zero because the VAT module of zero 
links directly to e file meaning VAT will keep a track of all, Zero will keep a track of all your VAT transactions. And at the end of the month, it will ask you, do you want me to push this into e filing And then you say, yes, they go all into your e filing So you need to just keep a separate ledger account in your accounting books, not necessarily a separate bank account. I hope that answers the question. Because keep in mind, at the end of the month, service is not going to say, okay, for the 100 rand or for the 100,000 you got, where's the 15,000? They will say, show us a calculation. You will then say, okay, I got 15, I got 115, 15,000 was yours. And then from that, my expenditures were this. So very seldom it will be the exact 15, because it will be the 15 less whatever was vetable from your expenses. And then the net is what you pay over to SARS. Or if it's a negative, it's what SARS will pay over to you. Yes, you can find yourself in situations where SARS does pay you. What would happen in those situations? Those situations normally happen right at the beginning of a project. Let's say construction. I get appointed today. It's an appointment letter. It's not an invoice, right? Appointment letter says, Peter, we need you on site from Monday. So I need to buy material. I need to buy this. I need to buy this. I need to buy this. So I buy all of that. Vet input, vet input, vet input, vet input. We get to month end. Quantity severe has not come to view where we are so that they can sign off so I can go bill. So I'm sitting in a what? an input position. Can I claim that I've got the invoices? Yeah, why not? I can't claim that I've got the support, okay? Um, and then let's take one more question before we moved. All right, this is from Dineo. It says, I registered my company in July, 2020. I bought a Bucky in May this year. Uh, the, it's registered under my company for business purposes. My tax practitioner said I could not claim the tax. When do I claim the tax? Okay, you see your tax practitioner, Nakon. Now, I'm not throwing any shade, right? But whenever someone tells you you can't do something, ask him, Baba, give me a section in the act. Give me some reference. You can't just say, I can't do something, or I can't do something. Where is it coming from? What the VAT Act says, it says you have five years. Five years, right? So meaning if you bought a bucky, and a bucky is actually not motor vehicle SD5. So section 17 of your VAT Act says, if you buy a motor vehicle, generally SARS would not allow because the normal use, and this was a principle back in the day, a private car business, it was very hard to link how the private car would be the business unless if you're running an Uber business, right? But um, Bucky, you're saying, guys, actually, this is not a family car. It's a two-seater. The rest of it, I'm carrying stuff. SARS actually does allow on the Bucky in section 17 of your income tax. So there you can claim the input on it. If you've got your paperwork, it's in the company's name. It's been used for business. I don't see why you cannot claim the VAT on it. Okay. But again, as I said, it's a case by case. I'm giving you a response based on what you've told me. I haven't analyzed everything that's happening in your business. If your tax practitioner has taken that view and it's substantiated, it is what it is. But if you feel it's not substantiated, then let's have a conversation. And actually on this one, I'll give you a free consult on it. Let's explore and see where you can claim or not, okay? Now to go back to one of the earlier questions, which was quite interesting from Terrence, right? He's asking, what is the advantage of buying a car under my business? Similarly to a house under your business, right? The biggest advantage is that costs that are related to that asset, they will still be classified as business expenditure. For example, you buy a car, right? You buy a car day, day one. If it's a bucky, I claim the full 14%. If it's not a bucky, SARS says they don't claim full, I won't claim. But because I'm using it in the business, on my installments, income tax, SARS says I will allow you a certain deduction because you're using this car in order for you to generate income that I will still tax, then SARS will allow you that, okay? If let's say you can't keep a logbook, then SARS says I'll work on a pro rata 80, 20, 60, 40 rule to then say, 80% is used for your personal, 20% is used for this, then I'll give you a reimbursive rate, okay? So SARS is not trying to penalize you for buying property in your personal or business name, okay? Same as with property as well. One of the things we've seen during the COVID with a number of my clients is that because prices had dropped, but some of these houses um, needed still work on it. So what would happen? A company would buy it, it sits on their balance sheet as an asset, right? Then the company will renovate it, maybe to have it as a site office, to have it as 
a lounge for the expos, I really don't care, right? Or a training center for that matter. You would then incur the renovations. Those renovations as well, you can deduct the tax on it, provided again, it's used for business purposes. Keep in mind, try to put yourself in, in, in SARS position. SARS is trying to say, I need to collect. So we keep the company called South Africa running, right? But in my collecting, I'm not going to be abusive and just take everything from everyone. If someone has incurred an expense to improve an asset, that will make sure tomorrow I'm able to collect more. Sure. This is actually interesting because what we saw during COVID as well is a lot of people started working from home. Okay. At some point in time, you were going to office either Melrose or Midrand or Bryanston if you're SNA. And then all of a sudden, boom, you're working from home. So SARS is saying, cool, for you to keep earning your salary so that I can tax you on it, there are certain expenses I understand that you need to incur. What are one of those expenses? You need to buy a table so you can work from home. You need to buy a router or a fiber or whatever is your choice is. But whatever expenses you spent at home in building that home office, SARS is saying, I will allow that. However, it still wants to see <clears throat> the support. Some of my clients that have gone the home expenditure route, like I mean, SARS was so pedantic, it wanted the plan of the house, right? To see which part of the house, are you, have you made an office? Are you using it exclusively for that? Or is it, did you just take the whole ten room and say, I'm working in the whole ten room? Or do you use proper square meters? So that's how pedantic we've seen that they are. One second, let me just get my clicker. Already, and I'm back on. So I think that covers those questions. So we, we, we're gonna move on now, right? So then when it comes to the VAT, okay? VAT again, we said this is done 50%. It's an indirect tax. So now we've covered, I've got my income tax that I need to do in my personal space and in the company done twice a year, right at the end of the year or somewhere in the middle. Those people that have more than one source of income, then SARS use this fancy name or a fancy term called provisional taxpayers. It just means SARS is saying, since you're not paying every month tax because you're self-employed, I need you to pay something six months into the financial year. Normally it would be around September. And then the other balance at year end. That is just the cash flow management system for SARS, okay? In your case, what does it mean? It just means the amount of money we're going to pay at year end, you're just splitting it into two payments. Cash flow easy as well. Ready? Let me take one more, one more question. Okay, it's a follow up. It says, hey, hey, I would say these trainings are quite interesting. So, could you say, is it advisable to use accounting systems simultaneously? No, 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 no. Actually, that is a red flag. Okay, that is actually a red, red flag to show that you're doing something dodgy. If you're using the same accounting system, surely you should be able to read off your tax. And I'll, and I'll use a very simple example for that, okay? If let's say now in my company, um, we're an accounting firm, we're a tax firm, we do auditing, we do BE verification, signers accredited, we do internal audit, we do IT audit, there's a lot of stuff, we do ESD, we do trainings like this. Let's use this training as an example, right? So now, when I, Riversense called and said, okay, dude, we need you to do training for us. Cool. Then I would have issued an invoice, right? When I issue that invoice, my invoice on the paper, it has my price and it has VAT and it has a total amount including VAT. For the customer, they pay the total amount. That total amount comes into my bank account. I get an SMS, ding, ding, money, right? And money, I see, okay, client is paid 115, okay? From that 115, my accounting system, if it's configured correctly, it's going to already say the 15 VAT, your income is actually 100. But if let's say I don't have an accounting system, then me as the client, me as the person or the taxpayer, I need to start recording some of that. Okay, there's 15 rand that came in that owes to SARS. And then tomorrow I realize, okay, I need to buy some water as I'm presenting, because I'm going to get thirsty, okay? So I go buy some water. They give me what? An invoice. So your six pack of water, because it's not a non-basic, there's going to be vet on it. It was X amount, the vet, let's say it's five rent. Then I take the five rent, I put it on that schedule, 15 rent minus five rent. So therefore I owe SARS 10 rent. 
for now. The month is still going on, right? Another client pays, and then that's how you keep track of it. If you've got a proper accounting system, the tracking will happen on the accounting system as well. I hope that answers the question as well. But actually, Kutiso, if you're ever going to run a simultaneous system, now, again, as I said, guys, I do investigations for SARS. I do this lifestyle. If I find you, you must prove it. For me, that is a red flag. I won't even want to listen to anything you're saying because the act is very clear. You need to run one set. The moment someone starts running two sets of system, for me, it triggers money laundering. It triggers you're trying to rip off SARS. There's money you don't want to declare. That report, I tell you, I will write all sorts of drama that, hey, 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 I don't even feel safe going back there again. Okay, so that is the worst thing you can do. Actually, that was a practice that used to happen back in the days for people that were deliberate in tax evasion. So what they would do, they would run an accounting system that has been cooked and they would run what they would call the raw numbers. The raw numbers, it's for them internally to say, are we making profit or not? But when the auditors come, when SARS comes, they show them all these fictitious numbers that are understated. That is illegal. That actually tantamounts to tax evasion, right? So if you didn't know, now you know. Don't say, I didn't know. One day, one day, we're going to meet. It's a very small world, I tell you, okay? Cool, cool, cool. So I think I've taken uh, a lot of these answers. Uh, okay, cool. So I see there's some questions around tax liabilities and the, the, the F&B instead accounting. Um, okay, I'll come back to these questions. Let's, let's, let's move on, guys, right. So then we get to PE, and you see right at the end, that's when I'll take the medical benefits part to determine how you can reduce your liabilities. Because actually, you do have a point. If now I'm paying a medical aid, i.e. discovery, bank med, whatever, whatever med, right? If I'm paying a medical aid and, and this other side, I'm an individual taxpayer. Yes, there's a benefit I need to get from that. What is the rationale? SARS is saying you had two options. You could either not be paying a medical aid, taking that money, eating it, and then when you're sick, you go to a public hospital and the government would have to give you service delivery, right? Or you're paying your medical aid, so when you're ill, you can just go to a private hospital. You're not putting a burden on the system. So SARS has to give you some sort of incentive, what they call credits, but we'll touch on it in a bit, okay? And then again, I guess, because we're probably not gonna come back to this, back to Kutiso saying, what are your thoughts on F&B instant accounting system in comparison to other accounting systems? Again, for me today, guys, today, I'm not trying to sell any accounting systems, but if you are picking an accounting system, there are a number of things I always say, look for. Number one, can you access it from anywhere? If the answer is yes, take it, it's a good system. Can you be able to generate invoices, quotations, and record your expenses? If the answer is yes, tick, it's a good system. Number three, does it have a sound security around it? Meaning, in this day of cyber, digital space, poppy act, how am I going to be able to ensure security of this system? If you can answer three to any of those systems and it falls within your price range, by all means, go for it. And I mean, accounting systems, they start from the cheapest one should be free, right? all the way to whatever you feel like pay. The choice is yours. Personally, I will have my preferences, something like FNB. The only issue I have with FNB is that it records transactions that are coming out of that FNB account. If let's say you're a business, you have now transactions coming in through cash, transactions that are coming through Yoko, transactions that are coming through another bank account, to bring it back into FNB instant accounting, it becomes a hassle. Because keep in mind, what is the purpose of FNB instant accounting? It's just to help you build the foundation blocks of running a business, be able to keep track of the expenses, be accountable. If your business is at that stage where FNB's instant solution works, by all means, continue with it. You know, I'm not gonna say move, continue with it, it works. You're able to track your expenses, you're able to track your invoices, okay? But as you're growing, rather get a proper accounting system. And I always say, get a proper accounting system that it will also talk to the quality of the financial statements you get. Well, what do I mean? If now I'm using FNB instant accounting and Peter's preparing my financial statements or Peter's my auditor, right? How easy am I going to be to get that information that's sitting on FNB instant accounting to Peter for him to prepare the financial statements, do my audit, or do the projections? 
Because keep in mind, financial statements, these are important for you as the business owner, but they are not for you. They are for the bank, they are for your employees, they are for your suppliers, they are for us as your accountant, they are for your potential customers, potential customers, they are for the trade unions. So there are a lot of people that actually need those financial statements other than you. It's good that you prepare them and look at them, but you're not the main stakeholder. That's why whenever we prepare financial statements, we ask that you think about the users being served, being the bank where you need funding, being your shareholders, being us as the accountants, all right? So now I think I've touched on, on those questions. Cool, 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 cool. Now we can go to PAYE. So PAYE, it's pay as you earn. P, pay, A, S, Y, U, E, earn. It's, it's one of the systems that SARS took to adopt quite a long time ago. I'm still private primary, not even born yet. And it said that because everyone in South Africa is not the same, right? We need to use a progressive system. That means the less you earn, the less tax you pay. The more you earn, the more tax you pay. Makes sense. The more you're making, the more we should be taxing you. So that's how it starts. And then some realized if everyone in South Africa, that's an employee, I needed to collect from them individually. I'm going to have a nightmare. Some people will just not want to pay and ignore me. Yeah? But I'm going to put the onus on the employer, right? So SARS then said, and this is going to be quite important for guys that are employing people, right? Because if you're employing people, the responsibility is on you. It's not on your employees. SARS, it's very random you hear SARS running after employees for not paying taxes because SARS is not expecting them to be paying taxes. SARS is expecting that you, as the employer, every month, if now someone came into your company and said, um, Dude, I need you to pay 10,000. That's my salary. That's what I need to get. Hence why there's a difference between the net pay and the CTC. Because in the CTC, you still need to take into account SARS or gross pay, your provident, your medical aid, and then the net pay, which is the thing thing that goes to the phone, right? So you negotiate with whatever employee you're talking to, you negotiate, you negotiate, dude, I'm the best thing you've ever seen. Trust me, you hire me in your company. Everything is going to run smooth, cool. What is your responsibility? The moment you give him that offer to contract or offer of employment, you as the employer need to go register on SARS. So that SARS, I've got an additional employee. Now, again, quite interesting here. I'm going to tell you an interesting story. There are two sides of the fence here. The first side is COVID has helped us identify employers that have not been paying their PYE to SARS. Because what happened come September in the lockdown, SARS says, I'm gonna give a relief to everyone that is paying PYE, UIF, and SDL. Normally they go as a trio, right? So SARS is saying, I'm gonna give a relief to all those people. Or SARS says, if your business has not been doing well, come to me, come and apply for the tariffs. And then what I'll do, I'll give you a young top up. Okay? Now, that is all good and well. But provided you as the employer were complying, that means you were paying your taxes, your guys are registered with the various SDLs, you're paying UIF. Now, if these things were not happening, they didn't even entertain your application. What then happened? They actually opened a hotline to say, employees, if your employer has been taking PYE, but has now not registered for tax, you can come and check if they've been paid. And quite a number of employees, needless to say, because the you know, employees and employer relationships always an interesting one. A number of these employees quickly went there. No, I can't find myself. Sarah, these people have been taking money and not paying it over. And all through that, Sarah was able to pick up quite a lot of non-compliant entities. Okay, same as where this will catch up with you. It's if let's say you have a person in your business that number one you retrench. Section 186 was quite popular, 189 rather, was quite popular last year, the Labor Relations Act. You try to retrench them because they were retrenched and you were paying UIF supposedly, they would have gone to you, Department of Labor, to try and claim their UIF insurance. And they're like, nah, nothing has been made. You busted them, they're gonna find you. Number two, someone goes on maternity leave, right? And when they're going on maternity leave, your policy says, I don't pay for maternity leave, but what I'll do, I'll guarantee your work. That's still in line with the Companies Act. But now because I'm going on maternity leave, I can, I'm eligible, according to the law of South Africa, to go and claim 
some sort of benefit from the UIF. I go there, I realize, no, my employer had not been paid. How? Guy, what happened? You know? Oh, last resort is where now we see people, occupational health hazards, someone breaks a leg or an arm at work. Now they're trying to go to Koida. Koida, I need my money. I've broken my arm, but your guy has never registered you. So this is the areas that generally an employer would be picked up, that they are not complied. And of course, you get to miss out on quite a lot of other benefits, such as your WSPs, your discretionary grants, your mandatory grants from the various CETAs. You miss out on that because you're not registered, okay? So in a nutshell, if I'm an employer, I've got employees, whether I have one, two, 200 or 500, I need to register them for SDL, PAYE, and UIF. That is money I deduct from the cost of company. That means when you're negotiating with your prospective employees, you need to take into account that. What again I see a lot in practice is come month end, business bills around the 1920s, ba, 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 customer pays. Customer pays 24, 25, 26, they run payroll. I pay the guys what they should be paid, but I don't pay SARS for PYE. I don't even submit my EMP 2020s, 201 or whatever it is, right? What then happens? Penalties, interest starts accruing. The time at the interim or when I'm now submitting a tender and my CSD says non-compliant, I call my accountant, what do you mean is non-compliant? And it's like, but dude, you haven't paid SARS in their PYE? You haven't submitted anything. Of course, it's going to be non-compliant. What do you want me to do? No, fix it, fix it, fix it. I've got a tender to do tomorrow. It's all on you. You're in that mess because of you. And I always say that my client will tell you better than anyone. If you're going to call me the night before because you have a tender, it's your tender brush. It's not ours. It's your tender. So I'm not going to wake up at 10 to fix your mess because you don't want to fix it throughout the month. Okay? So make sure as a business owner, you're on top of this. Right, because again, it's on you. Do you see no way here it talks about an accountant? It says you as the employer, meaning even if in the own company, I'm the only employee as the director, I'm employed in the company, and then the company's paying me a salary. PAYE still needs to be paid on that. SARS is not even flinching when it comes to that, because that is the month to month money that will kind of start coming into the business. All right? Cool. So I'm gonna move on. So I've got this clicker, it's a bit slow. Oh, it's off, it's not slow, it's off, okay. <laughs> We've touched on this, so we said tax deducted by employers from the employment income of employees. This is simple tax, and it needs to be paid by the employer on behalf of the employee to start. Why do we tax salaries, wages, bonuses, those three, okay? Now again, if someone earns a stipend, again, there's a threshold. Sarah says you start paying once you're over a certain amount. So if someone, I think the amount should be about what, 7,000 a month or 6.5, I tend to be corrected. If someone is earning about 6.5 and below a month, that thing, even if you had to punch it on the tax tables, it would not have a tax impact, okay? Cool. So you see the PYE, I like this picture because on the far left, you see that the employer is an intermediate. It similarly, it works like that. This has nothing to do with the employer. So the employer just collects and pays on behalf to SARS. Same as VET. Employer collects from the customer's invoice, pays on behalf of SARS, okay? With that amount of money, it goes into SARS, okay? SARS collects as a collector of government, bah, 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 bah. who then distributes this fund? Treasury. Okay, so SARS and Treasury are the two main core. So SARS is the revenue generating, Treasury is the spending arm, so the purse. Okay, so SARS then at the end of the year says, National Treasury Minister, I've got 26 trillion. And then National Treasury says, okay, let me drop budget. They drop budget. We're going to spend it on health, schools, education, infrastructure, vaccines now, PPE, shandies, but Treasury, that will come from Treasury, okay? Treasury will then plan on how to allocate it but SARS would have collected it. Meaning you as the employer, you are just the conduit. Don't feel special now feeling the need to report SARS. It does not end well, okay? And actually, if you're on social media, I always say on LinkedIn, if you follow our company page, I try to at least weekly post a case 
going on where either the business owner or the business owner and the accountant try to rip off SARS, how did they end up? They always end up in tears. Someone is in jail for seven years. Someone is fined for millions. So it, it doesn't end well. It doesn't end well. And worst part, at that point in time, keep in mind, the moment you become under investigation by SARS, SARS has the power to freeze your bank accounts. SARS has the power to actually go request other bank accounts that you might have not disclosed to them. Keep in mind, you, you, how do I say this? It's, it's simple to rip off or to lie to me as Peter because I'm an intermediate. I'm an accountant. You tell me, you give me the bank statements. I go represent you to SARS. But SARS, if they feel that you're not giving them the truth, they will just go get the information themselves. Go to the deeds office, go to the credit bureau, see, okay, let's see this guy's credit score. Oh, you're busy applying for accounts. You're telling people you're earning 100,000, but here you've told us you're, you're not earning money. Those are the discrepancies that SARS can pick up. And especially with the involvement of technology, that has become um, quite a, a hectic one. So now again, when you're an employer, meaning you're a company that is employing people in exchange for a salary, you need is you need to register, okay? You need to register within 21 days of becoming an employer. That's the general rule. Practices, sometimes you see that happening quite later. SARS is not that pedantic because they have a long-term view, but the law says within 21 days, okay? And it says um, none of the employees liable for normal tax. It means when you register, already these guys are in place. Had they been someone else deducting? And this is actually quite, quite interesting because what happens, I'm gonna use me as an example. I'm employed in SNA, right? I'm employed in SNA Chartered Accountants. As, as, as an employee there, right? Boom, 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 boom. They deduct my tax from my stipend or my salary, right? And then someone else comes and say, Peter, for two months, I need you to come work full time and look after my finance. My CFO was in a car accident or my CFO is recovering from COVID or my CFO is on maternity or paternity leave, whatever the case may be. Then I take up and secondary employment elsewhere, right? Those guys, Theoretically, they need to deduct the tax, but because I'm already taxed elsewhere, I need to inform them that guys, I'm already liable here, they're taxing it. So that can be declared as another income, so we can calculate the tax on it, but a double tax, it just means I'm gonna claim money back from SARS at the end of the year. Provided you have the necessary paperwork to show your employer, they are entitled to deduct, okay? Now, if you went to a bougie school, right, you will hear a lot of people saying, I'm already being taxed as a beneficiary in a trust. Meaning there was a trust fund baby who in the, the trust fund is giving the money, now you're employing them. And they're like, no, we need to get into some sort of tax neutral position. Already I received benefits from there that are taxed. Now you're gonna give me a salary and tax me again on the scale. Take the two as one and calculate a normal tax what it should be. Okay, now again, to every rule, there are exceptions. Where generally do we see exceptions um, to seasonal workers, particularly in the farming and picking? Let's say you generally get employed in season for oranges. So you come in to pick oranges and then you go. So you wouldn't necessarily meet the definition of an employee, meaning you're not working more than 22 hours a week for a particular employer or you're a labor broker or a PSP, professional services provider, then there'll be certain exceptions around that. But the general rule, again, this is not an advanced master class. So I'm not expecting advanced question. The general rule, you're employing people, you register them, you pay tax, you deduct the tax from their CTC. That means even when you're negotiating with them, keep that in mind that I need to have leeway to pay SARS, right? Because it does catch up with you and it catches up with you in the least way possible. Cool, up until this point, uh, I see there aren't any other questions. Let's look through the chat so that we touch that and right at the end, we can be able to wrap up everything, okay? It says, so from Koketo, Are, do I keep and submit every receipt as proof or can, or can they track every purchase made on the bank statement? Actually, this is a very, very, very good question. I'll go to the other questions, but let's deal with this one. SARS never said anything about bank statements. And actually, if you go into the VAT Act, the VAT Act, it's quite clear 
in your administration, it tells you how the invoice must be. It must have the name of the provider. It must have the date the services were provided. It must have your VAT number. It must have your domicile address. It must have a description of the service. It must have it, all of those things. They detail them in the act that they must be on the um, invoice, right? Now, how long you should keep them? Companies Act tells you you should keep all of your paperwork for seven years, meaning SARS can come today and say, uh, okay, so we were going through your tax submissions or your VAT submissions for 2017. Can you kindly provide us with both the bank statements and the invoices? The assumption is that you have those because Companies Act requires that you keep all of this paperwork in written format or an electronic format that can be easily converted to written. It's quite clear. So yes, you have to keep the invoices for each and every transaction to support your bed. Now, what does that mean? I personally have a lot of clients that are in the construction space. So in the construction space, the owner is sitting in Joburg, you've got a project running in Durban, you've got a project running in Free State, you've got another project running in Northern Cape, right? At this sides, you have project managers. What we have started introducing is that because these project managers, every Monday, the, 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 the contractor, the company owner would then give them money. Make sure you buy whatever you guys need on site, okay? Whether it be food for the guys, be some consumables, they need bob wire, they need tape, they need pipe, buy it, right? But then make sure the receipts are captured. Now, again, we live in a techno age. Back in the day, when I was still doing my articles, I remember whenever we are out of town, I even had a sleeve. I put those receipts in, staple them. First day, I'm back at the office, scan them, so I have a copy of them, so no one is on my case. But now the beauty of technology is that we, I mean, this is some of the softwares we have. There and there, the site manager using their smartphone, they can take a picture of it and upload it on our server. That's it. That is the evidence invoices sitting there. The bank statements will pull them throughout uh, at the end of the year. Types of softwares you can use for that. I mean, there's Hubdoc. That's also linked to Zero. We use that. Um, what we've seen in the past as well is what used to be Receipt Bank, now Dext. Again, cost benefit, you need to analyze and assess. QuickBooks as well has a way to capture. Generally, I always say before you even have a software, a simple picture, take a picture with your phone, make sure it's on your phone, you have that support that should you lose the invoice, at least you have them in electronic format, all right? I hope that answers the question that could get ahead. Um, so I see from, uh, okay, is it, I see another question say, is it possible to reduce my tax Using my medical aid, the answer is yes, but your personal tax. And again, let's break it down, right? If now you're the business owner, Terrence, right? And as the business owner, Terrence, you, you get a salary. So now medical aid is not a benefit. Let's start with scenario one. Medical aid is not a benefit. Uh, medical aid, you are paying yourself. So in that case, the full amount, you can go deduct as an expense to say, as a business owner, I'm incurring certain medical costs, such as medical aid, or you go to the pharmacy, or you go get a COVID test, whatever medical health thing. Because alternative, had you not incurred that, you could have gone to a public hospital, they would have given you that service for free. And that's putting pressure on them, tax, okay? So that's one way of doing it. Another way is where you're saying, cool, I'm gonna incorporate it as a fringe benefit or as a benefit in my package with the company that I own. Then what happens, the company, pays the premiums on behalf of me and I guess other executive or other qualifying employees. Then in that case, does the company, is the company able to deduct that? Yes. Why? It's an expense in their normal occurrences. It's an expense they're incurring for their executive staff to stay healthy, to ensure they keep running the business so money can come in so that SARS can charge them more. So yes, you can use your medical aid and what we call qualifying medical expenses. What are qualifying medical expenses? When you go to the chemist, when you go for your... Um, um, earlier on this year, I had to do some travels outside of South Africa. 
there was a lab test they need to do for the COVID. You know, you get your instant one where they poke your nose, they give you the results then. Then you get one that needs to go to the lab. I think it's about a thousand four. Then those ones will be your qualifying expenditures. Yes, you can get them because my rationale to SARS would be that SARS, I was not going on holiday when I was going to Namibia or Swaziland. I'm going on business so I can go make money so you can tax me more. So why can you not allow me to claim on these costs? So you can get, but again, you need to have firstly the receipts, have the support, and then get a professional accountant, sit down, see how you can optimize that, okay? And then from there, uh, from Salome, it says, at what business turnover is one supposed to be registered for VAT? The ad says 1 million. So if you're making a minimum of 80,000 a month, and it's, it's interesting, I'm gonna use the exact word of the ad. It says, you are making 1 million or you are expected to reasonably make 1 million. What does it mean you're expected to reasonably make 1 million? It means if at the beginning of the tax year you got a contract, let's say we're gonna give you 5 million. You need to register for VAT. You have not made that million yet. You have not made that 5 million yet, but by virtue of that contract, we can reasonably expect that you're gonna make that million. So you can register for VAT, even if it's purely based on what? A reasonable expectation, an offtake agreement, a purchase order. All right, but as long as you're making 1 million and above, you need, it's compulsory. But if you're making anything between 4,200 and 1 million, it's voluntarily, right? But the moment you cross the 1 million mark, SARS doesn't even wanna hear your side of the story. You need, you need, you need to do it, okay? Cool. Um, so I see uh, Philemon had answered 1 million compulsory between 50, yeah? Between, no, 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 no. 1 million and 50 million. Okay, 50,000 years, not million. Thank you, Philemon, for correcting that. Okay. Um, cool, cool, cool. So I think I've covered quite a lot of those. Right. So now we're going into the last bit of our session, guys, right? And it's coming now to the practical part, my tax returns. What does it mean? So yes, Peter, we we're in this session. Yes, Peter, we were talking. You said all this stuff, but what does it mean? It means, boom. Today was the day, today is the talk. In the next day, by the time we get to month and one, I needed to have sorted out my income tax. If you don't do that, SARS has put in place what we call auto assessment. It will assess you and it will come up to an amount. And because you are not there to correct it, it will make its own conclusion and start charging you penalties on its own conclusion, okay? So you want to jump in. That's the first thing you want to do. You want to go sort out your personal taxes. Now, another question I have is, what happens if I only came into the business this year, but I worked part of the year? Your employer where you worked would have already submitted their IRP5 straight into SARS e-filing. Go log in, go register, you'll find it. And then you will do the other part where now you're an entrepreneur, okay? Like I always say, stories that come in the last week of tech submissions are not stories, they're just excuses, okay? Cool, so that's number one. Sort out your personal taxes in the remaining few weeks. Cool, number two, your VAT. Your VAT, either you're late or it's gonna be due in the next two months because VAT is a frequent tax. Get a hold of that. Start gathering your invoices, start registering your VAT if you're making over a million. And normally the people in trainings that will ask, uh, Kunji, when is voluntary and compulsory registration? They're the ones I know they're making over the threshold. So go register and make sure your taxes are sorted, okay? That's the VAT. Make sure every two months that's done. Beautiful stuff is that you can get softwares and systems these days that literally they can almost kind of keep these things for you. So end of the month, you know what you owe SARS, what you need to pay SARS, what you need to claim. Rule of thumb, whenever you need to claim SARS, have the evidence ready because normally it will trigger what? An audit. SARS wants to know. This person says we owe them 70,000. Can you send us the evidence? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The same way if someone came and said, uh, can you pay me how much you owe me? You want to see, when you have, what, what, what did you render? How, why do I owe you? All of those questions, okay? Um, so cool, we've touched on this. Right, and then there'll be certain cases where if you plan your SARS properly, yes, government will pay you refund, meaning you overpay or you arrange your tax affairs properly. There's a certain quote I like that it's every man referring to women as well, it's right to arrange your taxes legally to ensure you're paying the least amount of tax possible. 
but it's not your right to avoid tax, SARS. That's called tax evasion. It's an illegal act. And me personally, I will tell SARS, I, 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 that hotline I will call because the day they catch you, you'll be like, I have an accountant, it's Peter. They're like, ah, Peter, why don't you tell us? You know you have an obligation. So call me a snitch, but I'm the girl snitch on you if your taxes are not in order, okay? Uh, cool, cool, cool. You will get a refund if you've overpaid SARS, and then you would need to pay SARS if you have underpaid throughout the year. Now, let me throw a spanner here, okay? I'll throw a spanner. What happens if, Peter, I'm doing work in Africa? Because Africa also has their certain own texts. For example, I render services in Nigeria. I render services in Nigeria. The cost I'm incurring them in South Africa, let's say it's accounting. They call me to Nigeria, come do training for us in Nigeria. I go there, I quote them. They pay to a bank I have in there or an establishment I have in there. What happens to that? In certain African countries, there's a concept called withholding tax. That unfortunately, it's something that different governments just have. Um, one of the key things that has been happening with the Africa free trade has to dispel that, to say, guys, you can't hold up to 30 or 40% of an invoice and call it withholding. But the entire purpose of it is that a lot of your Northern African, your Central African regions, countries had this notion that if you're going to be foreign, you come into our country, you do business, you quote, 40% of that invoice need to be spent in our country. You can't take the money out. It was a way of them to protect the wealth. But over time with digitization and globalization, the concept itself does not hold. Because now my stock I'm buying from India, my staff, I'm employing them from um, the USA, the work we're doing in, in, in uh, Nigeria, you can't just hold the money. You get what I'm trying to say? But again, it's something that will take quite a while. And then from there, the tax returns, just to recap, if you're a sole trader, you're doing it in your personal capacity. And if you're a per partnership, the both of you will do it in your personal capacity. Those that are still CC, CC is a form of company. You do it in the company's capacity. If you're a PTY, company's capacity. If you're an Inc. like myself, you do it in a company's capacity or a lawyer company's capacity. Cool. Now, the moment you submit your SARS, the SARS part, we are done. Boom. See, I shall right? We go to CIPC now in the next two minutes, right? Again, CIPC, it's not Peter's version of it. Okay, I'm not a pastor, guys. Not my interpretation of the act. Companies Act is quite clear to say at the anniversary, meaning a year later from the date of registration, when you open the company, every year later, you need to file your returns. It's the act. What is that for? Is that so that the Department of Trade and Industry or DTI or DTIC now can be able to know how many companies in South Africa are below the threshold of 10 million, below the threshold of 50 million? Why is it very important that we understand that? That is the pillar stone of BEE. Because BEE says, we as black businesses, we should be the majority of us in here, we need to start off as being exempt. You're making zero between zero and 10 million. There we are not really, it's not that onerous, pay the 100 rand. If you're late, we add a 50 rand, it's 150. You submit your taxes, generally your tax, then you shouldn't be making a lot, but it's okay, there's not a lot happening. Then you cross the 10 million, but you're still under 50 million. You're what then we call what? QSE, qualifying small entity. You're small, but you're not that small. Because if you think about it, if someone is making over 10 million a year, that person is making close to what? A million 800K a month. Already that person is a vet vendor because you would have met your 1 million mark already as an EME. So now you're a QSE, okay, you have money. Sarah then starts saying, what can we see? Don't tell us, sneak at this, sneak at that. You know? And then when you're making now over 50 million, Sars is like, okay, but now you're a corp. You're a multi company now. Now we're going to start getting our proper money back because you're going to employ people, create job employment. You're going to collect VAT, pay over VAT, so you're a serious company. And then there, your annual return amount, I think, goes up to about 2000. I stand to be corrected on this amount. Okay. So it says, if you're above 50 million and your PIS score, your PIS score now, again, it will talk about your public interest. Then you either submit what we call FAST, Financial Accountability Statements. It's not financial statements. 
A lot of people mistaken them to be financial statements. It's just you're telling CIPC. CIPC made turnover of this. I have X amount of people. Uh, I have an accountant that prepares this stuff internally, or I use PETA externally to prepare these things. You are accounting to CIPC on how much you made for statistical purposes. Then if you're making over the required amount, so i.e. you're getting audited, your PIS score is over 300, that means you're making good money, right? Or over 50 million rather. What then happens, they say they want your XBRL. XBRL, it's a type of reporting. That type of reporting, you hear keywords talk called taxonomies. That means whatever you're gonna tell CIPC, it's gonna mirror it against SARS. So that if you're lying, we're going to pick you up. Because SARS, you told them you're not making money, so you don't pay any tax, okay? CIPC, you're telling them you're making 50 million so you can get CIDB grade four. We see you, and that's where we're gonna catch you, okay? Or oh, they're gonna catch you, they're gonna call me to help them catch you. But bottom line, I'm on their side on this one. We're gonna catch you, okay? So that's where then the mirror of CIPC comes in. Because keep in mind, CIPC, which now, I mean, you can use Biz Portal, and I think they have a new platform. They're always trying to develop it. Big ups to the small business department. They are working. Contrary to popular belief, they are working. Um, so what happens with those? So your CIPC, your BE, your tax, your VAT, all of these things, where do they culminate in CSD in real time? So whenever you're submitting a your tax, you're not submitting a tax. It's updating CSD in real time. And I guess, what does it mean, CSD? It means if you had to tender today and your CSD is not compliant, automatically you're out, disqualified. Irrespective of the comrades, the leadership you know, the, the, the proposal you have, the lobbying you've done, you are out because you are not in compliance. Similarly to when a bank needs to borrow you money, if you're not trying to go raise capital at the banks, the banks will ask you, give us your compliance documents. Your compliance documents will show that you're in good standing with SARS, good standing with CIPC. And if those two things are not good standing, as a bank as well, they start getting like, yo, are we really going to borrow this guy money? Because this guy is a defunctional company. You are operating in SA. The rules in SA are saying A, B, C, and D. You are choosing to plant them and ignore them. And that does not work. And I'm going to use quite a quick, quick, quick one that... Actually, our CIPC system in South Africa is ranked to be in the top five in the world. Now, I've tried to register businesses, the likes of, I'm going to expose some of my end clients, Mauritius. We've tried to set up structures for some of our clients in Mauritius, Dubai, the UK. Okay, Ireland, it's still a bit easy, but CIPC is still by far one of the most simple, easy, and cost-effective. Meaning today you can wake up without a company and sleep in the evening with a company, a tax number, and a bank account all in one day. That's the efficiency of some of the systems that we have just to drive this entrepreneurial journey that South Africa has been on, okay? And then again, CIPC, we've touched on it. If you don't pay these penalties, actually what we've seen on the penalties for CIPC for years and years, they would just add the 50 rands, the 150. But I think the first time this year I had a client where the penalties were quite high, okay? They, 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 they were quite high and CIPC was not did not want to hear any of it. Do I need to submit my annual returns even if my company is dormant or inactive? The answer is yes. You are still legally required, okay? You are still legally required to submit it, all right? And then you can do it on the system, make your, your, your payments either on BizPro or on CIPC. So up until this point, I think I've covered quite a number of the questions, but I don't know. Um, I can hand over back to you, um, Juliet, and I can take some questions. Great, thank you, um, Peter. Um, for a very engaging workshop on tax. I think um, those are all the questions that were in our Q&A and in our chat. Um, but if you have any other questions, this is a good opportunity to raise your hands or ask us on the chat. Just give it a moment. Don't be shy. Yeah, don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. I think we've probably had about 
12 or 13 questions that you've already answered. So thank you, Peter, for a very engaging workshop, um, as always. And thank you, um, SMEs and entrepreneurs, for joining us today. This is part of our Project Thrive initiative. So if you have any queries about um, interest-free loans that River Sands is offering, or any questions about this workshop or Peter, you're welcome. Peter, if you can just share. Um, so we have a comment saying, I don't have any questions, but I found tax really complicated until this workshop. Thank you, Mr. Sarit. That's, that's great feedback. Thank you very much, um, Nukwetaba. Great, so if you have any questions, um, let me just type in the, the email address. So it's thrive at riversandsihub.co.za. You're welcome to contact us either through our social media channels or through our normal contact channels or through this email address, thrive at riversandsihub.co.za. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for the generator gods for keeping this webinar uninterrupted whilst we're still in load shedding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheers. everyone. Thank you.